here's my question. How many of you have brothers or sisters? A lot of you. Not everybody. That's all right. That's cool. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people have brothers or sisters. I want to talk to you briefly today about brothers and sisters and friends. Okay? I want to share with you something that my mom told me when I was little. I don't know about you, but I used to fight with my brothers a lot. Yeah? I got a witness right here. Right here. Okay. I used to fight with my brothers a lot. I fought with my brothers more than I would fight with my friends. You know? I'd, I'd play nicely with my friends, and then I'd go home from school and fight with my brothers. And my mom told me something very important, and I want to tell you this too. Sometimes friends come and go. Sometimes you get along. Sometimes you don't get along. But if you have a brother or a sister, they're still your brother or your sister whether you get along or not. Does that make sense? If I'm fighting with my brother and we can't play together nicely, we can't talk together nicely, he's still my brother. And if I go all day and I'm still angry at him, tomorrow he will still be my brother. And if I go all week and I'm still angry at him, next week, he will still be my brother. <laughs> right? He'll still be your brother forever. That's right. He'll be my brother forever. So I've got something pretty good there because I could treat my brother nicely and we could be friends for my whole life because we'll be brothers my whole life do you like to have a friend who was your friend for your whole life? Yeah. So I want you to remember that if you're like me and you disagree with your brothers and sisters, you're going to be brothers and sisters your whole life. Yeah. It's a good opportunity. Now, who doesn't have a brother or a sister? It's you? Okay. That's okay. There's something cool about that too. You ready for this? That type of way to treat brothers and sisters where they can be your brother and your sister your whole life, you can decide to treat your friends that way. You can decide, even though this person isn't my brother, it's just my buddy, I can decide to treat him like a brother and love him like a brother. And that friendship can be a good friendship to last you a long, long time. Pretty cool. Okay. That's all I've got for you this morning. Don't forget to love your brothers and your sisters, okay? You'll never get rid of them. Okay, you're dismissed. You can go to Children's Church or you can go back to sit with your families. I don't know how young I was when my mom started telling me that, uh, but I was certainly too young to have any idea what in the world it meant. But later as I got older, I started to figure it out, you know, as I discovered that... Uh, well, a friend one year in school is not necessarily your friend the next year in school, but I still have to deal with my brother. Yeah, so that's a life lesson I've learned. Still working on that right now because I still have brothers, but anyway. All right, if, uh, if you've been here any time over the last several months, you kn probably know we've been working our way gradually through Hebrews. Well, today we're on the last chapter of Hebrews, uh, chapter 13. And uh, the Hebrews is a letter. It was originally written from a Christian leader to a group of Christians. And from there it was intended to be spread so that other Christians could benefit from it. But it was a letter. You know, where you start with dear so-and-so and you end with, you know, love and kisses so-and-so. And you put your name at the end or something like that. It was a letter. And at the end of this letter, like a lot of the letters in the New Testament of the Bible... The last chapter is, it's a little bit random. It's kind of like the person sat down to write this letter and they had maybe one or two or three big thoughts that they really needed to write about. And then they got to the end of the letter. They realized they'd said pretty much everything. They sum it all up really quick. But there's this other one thing I can't, I can't forget to mention this. This is important. And then, oh yeah, and, and this. Don't forget to mention this. And uh, tell so-and-so I said hi. And sometimes that seems really random. Kind of like the shotgun approach. 
Well, that's the chapter of Hebrews we're looking at today. And I would put it to you that it's not totally random, even though some of the topics appear to only be there for one or two sentences. What I think is going on when this happens at the end of the New Testament letters is this Christian leader had something important to write about. And when they get to the point where they close their letter, the Holy Spirit presses on their heart several other things that are usually the basics of Christianity. Simple stuff. And now that we've treated this important issue for so long in a long written message, don't forget this and this and this. Don't forget this and this. They're the basics of your faith. And everybody needs reminders of those basics. Today we'll be celebrating communion together. And uh, I invite you this morning to use this list of reminders of the basics of Christian faith as part of the way that you prepare to take communion. Think of your life. Uh, no matter how short a time or how long a time you've been a Christian, or if you're not a Christian yet and you're thinking about it, consider your life and these brief basics of the Christian walk. All right, if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to start with verse 1 of Hebrews 13. And if you haven't brought a Bible this morning, there are some Bibles around you in the pews if you want to read with us. We're going to read verses 1 through 16 of Hebrews 13. All right, here comes the children's message. Ready? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Okay, a little bit of the shotgun effect there. A lot of one-sentence topics. You know, try and string those together into a persuasive essay. It's, you know, it's not going to work very well. Uh, but we're going to look at each one of these little reminders briefly this morning. And I won't interview you all after the fact, but I'd be willing that there's somebody in here that each one of these is for this morning. So, if it seems a little bit random, be just that much patient this morning, because I'd bet that the Holy Spirit has something to say to you. I know there are several of these that apply to me. Okay. So it turns out these last-minute uh, thoughts in the book of Hebrews are the basics of Christian faith. And first, we have three instructions grouped together that are in the category of loving others. Verse 1 of this chapter says we are to keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. 
And I think since this letter is written to a group of Christians, when it says one another, I think it's probably mostly referring to relationships inside the church, relationships between Christians. Uh, it seems that the book of Hebrews was written to Christians in a time when they were being persecuted. And so it would make sense in particular for a Christian leader to say, in the way you relate to each other, make sure you're doing it right. Love each other as brothers and sisters. You know, stick together. This is a tough time. I'm not going to ask any of you to do this, not even Brock. But if I were to ask each of you individually to take turns, come up on the stage, look out at this congregation and ask you, how many people do you see about whom you could really honestly say, I love him like a brother. I love her like a sister. Or I know that she loves me like a sister. It's easy enough to say have good relationships in the Christian family. That's good. Uh, you have good relationships by avoiding hard topics, talking pleasantly about the weather, and sharing food. Uh, you love each other by, like brothers and sisters by sharing not only your food but your lives. And when you know somebody well and you need to talk about a hard topic together, you don't avoid it. That's part of love. And when two of you disagree about something, it doesn't get in the way of your relationship because you care for each other, even though you disagree. That's more like loving each other as brothers and sisters. Verse 2 gives us the second instruction about loving others, saying, Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And yes, it would be quite hypocritical of us as Christians to say it's important to love each other, but not other people, wouldn't it? That would be terrible. That's obvious. But hospitality to strangers, that's tough. Uh, how do you show hospitality to strangers? Should I be inviting random people off the street who I've never met before to sleep in my house? I don't know. There might be some settings in which case that's the right choice. I haven't done that before. Hopefully it's not because I'm really failing as a hospitable person. Uh, but it's a hard thing to think about. How do I show hospitality to strangers? I think if we start with something small, we can train our hearts in the right direction, though. I'd be willing to bet that I'm not the only one in here who forgets to treat my gas station attendant as a human being instead of a part of a machine that serves my need. <coughs> I'd be willing to bet I'm not the only person in here who forgets that the groceries don't bag themselves automatically. That's actually a person who has a family and a life and feelings. And I frequently forget to treat them like a person. That's a stranger who I could have a much more hospitable attitude toward. How many of you currently use or have in some point in your life used public transportation on a regular basis? Buses, trains, anything like that. Okay, some of you. Modesto has some public transport. Big, you know, some really intensely larger cities might have more. If you've ever ridden on a bus that's full of people and you're not sitting down, you're hanging on to the bar like this, you know, and there's somebody about six inches behind you also doing this, right? And it's very personal space without being personal relationship. There are people around us everywhere in our lives who we don't know, and we don't know what they're going through. And who knows the next time I go shopping, if the person in the aisle in front of me who just looks downtrodden has been put in the same aisle with me just so that I can share some simple, kind words. You know, I don't have to ask somebody I've never met before, how's your relationship with your father? But I can be brave enough in the strength that Christ's Spirit gives me to say, hi, uh, how you doing today? You all right? And I usually don't. I think I need to work on being hospitable to strangers. Um, with some of these things that sound simple but are hard, it's important to remember that we've not been called as Christians to do whatever comes naturally. We've been called as Christians to share the love of Christ. 
Third instruction on love says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. It's one thing to recognize cognitively in our minds that there are people near us, around us, or in the world abroad who have things harder off than we are. It's one thing to realize with our brains that there are people who are hungry on a regular basis. There are people who are hurt by those who should care about them most. And there are people, even here in Modesto, who are bought and sold as slaves. It's one thing to know that with our brains. But if you're like me, most of the time, you don't have enough emotion to feel the full impact of that all day, every day. And so we put up emotional barriers between what we know and what we feel. Uh, even about our own experiences and our own hurts and our own families. But if we are ever to act on the love of God for the sake of those people, whether we know them or don't know them, we're going to have to let our emotions engage with what we know in our heads. And that is one of those hard things that we're asked to do as Christians. If we're ever going to do something about it, whether it be great or small, we're going to have to let ourselves feel something about those who are suffering not just to know it. So remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So those are our first three reminders on what it means to live life as a Christian. And they're all about love. Love one another as brothers and sisters. Show hospitality to strangers. And remember those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Reminders for us of the basics of Christian living because knowing all the true facts will not necessarily make you more like Jesus, but trusting and allowing God to change the way you love, that will. Next, we move on to a few warnings that urge us to shield ourselves against sin. In verse 4, it says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Uh, throughout the Bible, it seems that sins of a sexual nature are treated very severely compared to other sins. Um, almost as if they were worse than many kinds of sin. And they're not the only type of sin in that category. Uh, but I think that's an interesting pattern. In one sense, a sin is a sin. Every fault in us, every shortcoming, needs to be forgiven. It needs the forgiveness of God and the love of Jesus to cover us. We need to be changed by the Holy Spirit uh, more and more like Christ. Whether it's something that seems large and heinous and terrible, or something that seems pretty small and innocuous. Um, gossip might seem pretty small and innocuous. Having a habit of telling white lies to keep yourself out of trouble, that might seem pretty small and innocuous depending on the context. Um, but in a different sense, I do think some sins are worse than others because they cause more damage to ourselves and to those around us. You know, I don't think anybody would argue that lying and murder are on the same plane as to take really extreme examples because depending on your choices, it has a bigger effect to damage yourself and the people around you and the world that we've been given to live in. Sexual sins of all kinds wound deeply and affect many people. If you give your body to someone you aren't married to, who you aren't committed to living with and loving for the rest of your life, you aren't just using your body, you're involving your heart and your soul whether you want to or not. You cut out a chunk of yourself and you give it away as if you didn't need it. Wounds like that are hard to heal from and can never be undone. Even worse, perhaps, is the fact that when you give yourself some, to someone who you aren't married to, you forget that if you are married, God has joined you to the person you've married. You don't have a legal arrangement so much as you are one person. And to have sex with someone else is to rip your heart and soul away from your spouse. And if you have kids, to leave them with a home that has a great tear in it. And all manner of fear, insecurity, loneliness can seep in through that rift 
into a space that should be full of love. And maybe you're not having an affair. Maybe you have some other sexual sin in your life. Maybe it's pornography that is wounding you and your spouse or your family. Or maybe you don't have a family. Maybe you're not married or you don't have kids and, and you have some patterns in your life that, are, that I've just described and you think, you know, it's okay for now. There's nobody I'm committed to. Well, the wound is still in you if that's true. And if you do ever decide to commit to a marriage relationship or have somebody younger than you that you need to take care of and love like a child, you bring that wound with you. Marriage should be honored by all. Take it seriously. After this, the author moves on to talk about greed. And I think the way he talks about greed is very interesting. And I don't usually think about greed this way. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? See, it doesn't just say greed's an awful thing. It spoils a lot of, a lot of your life. Uh, don't do it. It goes deeper to connect greed or the initial source of greed with a fear that we won't have enough. It connects the love of money with the worry that we won't have enough money and says that's often where greed starts. And so we can fight the temptation to fall into greed and the love of money with faith in God's promises that when God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, he means it. And if we really don't need to worry that God will abandon us and leave us with nothing, if we don't need to worry about that, we also don't need to pile up big protective piles of comfort or wealth around us to fend off our fear of being in need. We won't need that. I think that's a pretty trippy perspective on greed, and I don't usually think about greed that way. I think when I think greed, I think, you know, big guys in nice suits who are used to being rich and don't want to stop being rich. But that started somewhere for most of them. Greed starts somewhere. And I think that the author of Hebrews is right. It often starts in fear. So if we fully trust God to provide for us, we don't need to surround ourselves with that protective wall of belongings. After greed in verse 7, it says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I lump this one together with the warnings against temptation, with the warning against sexual sin and against the love of money, because it's specifically saying, remember your Christian leaders and look at the result of the way that they've lived. Look at that life. Is it a life that seems appealing to you? Is it a life that's primarily described by love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the other fruits of the Spirit? in the midst of the difficulty of life? Because that's the result of living life the way God wants us to live it. So our lives are described by love and joy and peace and patience. I'd like to have more patience. So I group this together with the warnings against temptation. It's a positive reinforcement against your temptation. It's a positive reinforcement to choose not to sin. Why? Because it's worth doing. It works out well. God didn't give us rules because he really loves rules. He gave us rules because he knows the best way to live. He designed life this way. He wants us to be able to live it well and in connection with him. So first we were given three reminders to love. To love each other, to be hospitable to strangers, and to remember those who suffer as if we ourselves were suffering. Second, we're warned against falling into sin, specifically to honor marriage to trust God so that we don't fall into the love of money, and to imitate the lives of Christians who've gone ahead of us in their faith because it's worth it. These are reminders of the basics of Christian living because if we forget the basics, we'll never grow any closer to God than we are now. 
Third, the author reminds us in three ways to cling tightly to what we believe. Here he also does a little bit of summarizing some of the themes discussed in the book of Hebrews. In verse 9, it says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. Here he's referring to the confusion many early Christians seem to have had about what exactly they had to do to keep God's grace. Did they still need to make all the sacrifices that God asked the Jewish people to do in the Old Testament? How much of that was still relevant? If Jesus has forgiven my sins, do I still need to sacrifice lambs? And the answer is a very definite, no, you don't. Because Jesus allowed himself to be sacrificed for us, even though he was completely innocent. He paid the price for our wrongdoing, and nothing more is needed. And I, I doubt that any of us have ever wondered whether we really ought to, as a church, be slaughtering lambs on our, the corner of our lawn out here for forgiveness of sins. I don't think probably many of us have had that confusion. But I do think all of us, in some way and at some time, have started to think as though we need to earn our salvation. Have started to wonder, am I, really on, am I really on God's good side right now because I don't know if I've earned it? I don't know if he's really going to extend to me that grace that I'm looking for and that I see in Scripture because I haven't really deserved it. We're not supposed to deserve it. We're supposed to accept it. We're not supposed to earn it. We're supposed to accept it. Our lives are supposed to change and become more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you don't have to do that and then get grace. You get grace. And the grace in your life changes you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is our reminder, even though it's given in terms for early Christians who are looking at Jewish sacrifices, this is our reminder that we don't have to purchase grace from God. Jesus did the paying. In fact, it says that we have... I lost the line. It says we have a table to eat from that those who follow those old ceremonial rules and try and earn their grace, they don't have any right to eat at that table with us. Which I think is a roundabout way of saying if you're trying to purchase your salvation from God still, then you're not trusting him. You're still trusting yourself to be able to earn it. And that makes it not grace. That makes it some kind of payment for something that you've deserved. And that's not how God works. And that's not how we're designed to work. If you're trying to purchase salvation from Jesus, you might be keeping yourself from getting it. It requires trust in Jesus and not in ourselves. The author goes on in verse 11, still referring to the Old Testament system of sacrifices, saying, The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. This is a reminder for us that Jesus was rejected by his people and by his culture and by the very world that he had created. As the ultimate symbol of that exclusion and rejection, he was taken outside the city to be killed when he was hung on a cross. In a similar way, if we follow Jesus, we'll end up on the outside. We can never fully be a part of a culture that highly values selfishness and independence because the Bible teaches us that we're made to be selfless in giving, that we're made to be dependent on God and interdependent on each other. If God is remaking us in the image of his son Jesus, then we must be in the world, but not like the world. And from time to time, the world will make sure we feel the pain of rejection. Just a little bit of what Jesus felt. The good news is, though, there is a kingdom that we belong to, if you're a Christian. You might be somewhat excluded from this world, 
because we can't fully share the values that the world has tried to teach us. We have to be taught the values that God holds most dear. But there is a kingdom that we belong to. It says we don't have a permanent city here, but we're waiting for the one that is to come. The kingdom of God is both something that's very real in our hearts and in our community as Christians right now, and a promise of one day living in the very presence and under the very rule of God himself, either when we die or when Jesus returns. That's the kingdom we belong to. And although it's discouraging to think, you know, as long as I'm alive in this world, I can't fully belong. I'm called to serve a world that I can't fully be a part of. I think that discouragement is completely overbalanced by the fact that I do belong to the kingdom of God. And wherever I go, I bring that kingdom with me. Which is why the third reminder in this set to cling to what we believe. And the last one we're going to go over today in verse 15, it says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It's one of the basics of Christian living to remember that we are created to worship God both with our mouths and with our choices. Because serving the needs of others, doing good, brings praise to God. So the writer of Hebrews kind of took the shotgun approach here with his closing chapter, throwing together at least nine, I count nine or more, different reminders and instructions that are mostly about the basics of Christian living. And I think that that's important for him to have tagged on here at the end of the book, even though some of them might not blend very well with the rest of the book. Because if it's the basics, then it's some of the simplest and most important advice we could get. Love each other like brothers and sisters. Show hospitality to strangers. Remember those who are suffering as if you were suffering. Honor marriage. Trust God and don't fall into greed. Follow the example of those who are mature in our faith, more mature in their faith than you are. Remember that God's forgiveness needs to be accepted. It doesn't need to be earned. Remember that if you are a Christian, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. And we don't fully belong to this broken world that we're here to serve. And last, remember that your words and your actions should bring God praise by serving others' needs. I'm going to invite the worship team back up to uh, lead us in a closing song. And after we sing, we're going to take communion together. And I invite you again this morning uh, to consider these reminders and ask the Lord whether any of them are for you. Several of them are for me, but we all need reminders from time to time, no matter how long we've known the Lord. Let's prepare for communion in our hearts. Stand and sing with us, please. May the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.